Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this particular series is entitled The Promise, God's Everlasting Covenant. And this is lesson number five in that series. This lesson is entitled Children of the Promise. It's the lesson from May 1 of 2021, and we hope you'll enjoy it. We as usual, would like to begin with a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we've come once again to think about your word, to discuss it together, and to find ways in which we can encourage people who might be listening to dig deeper into the scriptures and understand some of the great truths that are buried there. Help us to do our best with the help of your Holy Spirit is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. How many covenant promises did God make to Abraham? In fact, most of them were made to Abram, not to Abraham. <laughs> By the time he got to Abraham, he wasn't making a whole lot of covenant promises still. So, in what way was the Lord a shield to Abraham? We'll look at that. How were all families on the earth to be blessed through Abraham? What was the greatest of all covenant promises? You all Think you can answer those questions before we study them? Well, in Genesis 14, we read about Abraham with the help of some others. And once again, I would mention, we always call him Abraham, but in fact, at that point in time, he was Abram, not Abraham, defeating a large army, attacking them and destroying them. This caused Abraham to worry that he would become a target. Jim? Abraham gladly returned to his tents and his flocks, but his mind was disturbed by harassing thoughts. He had been a man of peace, so far as possible shunning en enmity and strife, and with horror he recalled the scene of carnage he had witnessed. But the nations whose forces he had defeated would doubtless renew the invasion of Canaan and make him the special object of their vengeance. Becoming thus involved in national quarrels, the peaceful quiet of his life would be broken. Can I interrupt for just a second? Would, if you were one of those nations and you lost all their, all your five nations lost their kings and all their military, would you think it was a good idea to attack Abraham? <laughs> I don't know, somehow it seems to me not to be such a good idea. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Furthermore, he had not entered the possession of Canaan, nor could he now hope for an heir to whom the promise might be fulfilled. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 136. So he's worried about what's going to happen. He still has no children, no, none, no, none of the promised children that he thought he was going to get. Charles, Genesis you want... Genesis 15, 1 through 3. After this, Abram had a vision and heard the Lord say to him, Do not be afraid, Abram. I will shield you from, from damn danger and give you a great reward. But Abraham answered, Sovereign Lord, what good will your reward do to me since I have no children? My only heir is Eliezer of Damascus. You have given me no children, and one of my slaves will inherit my property. American Bible Society. The Holy Bible, the Good News Translation, yeah. Translation. Notice in this passage that God said to Abraham, I will shield you. This is the God of the universe, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, promising to a single individual. Is that the nature of protection? Is that what he's saying? Yeah, well, that's what we need to talk about. What are the implications of having God personally as your shield? There are many other references de de designating God's shield found in Scripture, such as Deuteronomy 33, 29, Psalm 18. Let's just look at this one here, Deuteronomy 32, 29. Israel, how happy you are. There is no one like you, a nation saved by the Lord. The Lord himself is your shield and your sword. But who's that promised to? Israel. The whole nation of Israel. And the others are all the same way. I mean, it's one thing to have a whole nation promised something like that, but God... God promised Abraham himself, a single person. But, you know, as we mentioned, these things are directed to whole groups, like the nation of Israel. 
In Abraham's case, Abraham's case, the promise was personal and individual. So thinking back what, what we do know about Abraham, which is probably not a whole lot, uh, we know that he was the leader, his household included how many people? A thousand. Thousands of heads of households. That's Amazing. He had 300 and th 318 warriors that I'm sure was out, their job was just to protect his, his herds from getting stolen. So he was, the, he was like a mini nation all by himself. So this promise to God, do you think that included his entire household? Yes. His heart was right with the sovereign Lord whom how much he knew of, maybe you could tell. <laughs> yeah. No, he, did he have a, how much concept he, uh, what, he had a, he knew that there was a single God, mm -hmm. single creator. Yes. But beyond that, well, he had no Bible. Right. There was no written language of it. Well, they were, there was some, they were starting to develop cuneiform and hieroglyphics, but not much. I, I doubt that he knew how to read. Maybe, maybe cuneiform, because he was- But his heart was right. Yeah. He didn't cheat people, yeah. he protected them. Yeah. And the Lord says, well, I'm gonna have a covenant with you. Yeah. Well, um, it was these fighting men that he took with him to conquer the enemies who had captured Lot and his family. Kerry? God called Abraham to be a teacher of his word. He chose him to be the father of a great nation because he saw that Abraham would instruct his children and his household in the principles of God's law. And that which gave power to Abraham, Abraham's teaching was the influence of his own life. His great household consisted of more than a thousand souls, many of them heads of families, and not a few, but newly converted from heathenism. Such a household required a firm hand at the helm. No weak, vacillating methods would suffice. Of Abraham, God said, I know him that he will command his children and his household after him. That's Genesis 18. Wow. Yet his authority was exercised with such wisdom and tenderness that hearts were won. The testimony of the divine watcher is, they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment. Genesis eighteen nineteen, And Abraham's influence extended beyond his own household. Wherever he pitched his tent, he set up beside it the altar for sacrifice and worship. When the tent was removed, the altar remained, and many a roving Canaanite, whose knowledge of God has been gained from the life of Abraham his servant, tarried at that altar to offer sacrifice to Jehovah. And that's from Mrs. White in Patriots and Prophets and Education. Yes. Well, let's think about that for a moment. Let's, let's try to think of in terms of Abraham here. Here's a gentleman who moves into a territory. This territory probably consisted mostly of small, maybe individual families or a few family, a, a little bit larger family with, you know, maybe if they were really wealthy, a hundred animals. And here comes Abraham. And how would you, how would you look at that? What would you think about that? Like an invasion. <laughs> <laughs> like an invasion. But I think people would respect him just enormously look at this man, yeah. you know? And people all around heard about him. It's just, yeah. here is one man we can trust. Yep. Because in those days, might was right. Mm -hmm. Might was right. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm sure he, he went out and probably helped people, and they, and they joined themselves. It was better, better working for Abraham and right. putting your flocks in with his and having him protect you and so forth than being out there in the, among the riffraff. Right. right, yeah. Well, as we consider this wonderful promise made to Abraham, do we have any promises of a similar nature addressed to us as Christians? 1 Corinthians 10, 13, every test that you have experienced is the kind that normally comes to people. But God keeps his promise, and he will not allow you to be tested beyond your power to remain firm, 
At the time you are put to the test, he will give you the strength to endure it and so provide you with a way out. That's also from the Good News Bible. Look at Genesis 28, 14. That covenant promised Abraham was repeated to Jacob as he fled from his brother. Jim? Genesis 28, 14. God said, They will be as numerous as the specks of dust on the earth. They will extend their territory, territory in all directions, and through you and your descendants I will bless all the nations. So that's almost a verbatim repetition of the promise he'd made to Abraham, right? Yeah. And guess what? We can all be a part of Abraham's family. Galatians 3.29 If you belong to Christ, then you are the descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Again, good news Bible. Yeah, there is a possibility that all families on this earth could be blessed. How many does that include? All. A lot of people, right? Yes. If it were not true that this promise to Abraham and, and fulfilled in Christ includes all that we receive through the life and death of Christ, of what use would it be? So what we're saying here is that that promise focused itself through whom? Through Abraham. Abraham, Abraham but down to his special, his very special son, their grandson, great, 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 somewhere grandson, Jesus Christ. Christ. Yeah, it's yeah. through Jesus Christ that that promise comes. Okay, um, through the life and death of Jesus, what use would it be? Humanly, it might be nice to be the father of a great nation, but how does that compare to being the ancestor of the Savior of the world or inheriting eternal life with God? I mean, I, I try to think about what it would be like to be in heaven. Mm. And, you, you know, we, we've, got, we've gotten kind of spoiled. I, I, I work with uh, medical students and residents and physician assistant students and so forth and and they've gotten the younger generation now you ask them a question about almost anything oh mm -hmm. google says da 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 and here's the answer yes yes but what's going to happen when we get to heaven god is probably not just going to answer questions like that he's going to say find out for yourself you got enough time <laughs> figure it out but i you know i it, and, and these young people are so fast with those devices, even on their phones, you hardly had a chance to answer, I mean, to look and even ask the question, and they're already looking at the answer. Wow. There was no reason, I want to emphasize this again, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again, there was no reason for Christ to have come the first time if he was not planning to come back. Surely we all recognize that Jesus is our only hope of salvation. What could anyone want more than the promise of eternal life in a place where there is no pain, no evil, no suffering, and where we can enjoy eternal fellowship with the God who is our Father and the God of the universe? Can we be sure that those promises to Abraham include us, Carrie? Galatians 3, and I'm reading from verses 8 to 9, and then 27 to 29. The scripture predicted that God would put the Gentiles right with himself through faith. And so the scripture announced the good news to Abraham. Through you, God will bless the whole human race. Abraham believed and was blessed, so all who believe are blessed as he was. You were baptized into union with Christ, and now you were clothed, so to speak, with the life of Christ himself. So there is no difference between Jews and Gentiles, between slaves and freed people, between men and women. You are all one in union with Christ Jesus. I'm going to interrupt there for just a second. <clears throat> Who is this writing these words? Paul. Paul. A Pharisee of yes. the Pharisees. And when he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, did he believe there was no difference between Jews and Gentiles, oh, between no slaves and free, that's, that's people, what I mean. between men and men, between, we're all in union. Yeah, I, I mean, think of, this is, you know, Ellen White describes this, of, you know, in, in a war, if a general is, is killed, that's a great loss to the side. But what happens if the general trades sides? Oh, my. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> that's what happened in the case of Paul, isn't it? Right. Just amazing. So, right. yeah, just to have these kind of words. And why is he using these kind of words, I might ask? Why was he writing to the Galatians? You remember? I'm asking you really dig deep now here. Remember back in chapter 1, he said, if anyone tries to tell you, give you a different gospel than the one I gave you, Did may, he, he, be a uh, may he be a condemned to condemned? hell. Really? Yes. Yeah. And he says it again. And really what, what he's arguing against is some Jewish Christians following around behind him, trying to convince Gentile Christians that they had to follow all the Jewish customs. They had to be circumcised, they had to do all those kind of things before they could be real Christians, you understand. Yeah. And so this is Paul, the Pharisee of the Pharisees, <laughs> saying, to, stop that nonsense. That's completely against the will of God. Well, he had to confront uh, St. Peter. Yeah. That's right. Yes. One thing I find in these uh, verses is a, a powerful word, believed. Yeah. yeah. It's an action Have word. faith. Uh, yes. Uh, faith, believe, trust. And it was counted as righteousness. Yes. We look at the last verse there. If you belong to Christ, then you are descendants of Abraham and will receive what God has promised. Right. It's from the Good News Bible again. Thank you, Carrie. So what is God saying to us? He's not concerned about the DNA in ourselves. He's concerned about our relationship to Him. Mm. And that relationship is possible for every human being who has any thinking capacity. So, has God placed within our hearts and minds an earnest longing to return to the Edenic environment? Yes. Um, I recently came across a passage which uh, I, 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 I was quite shocked when I read it, but it's there. I went back and looked again. It's there. The people before the flood were constantly looking for some way that they could get into the Garden of Eden and eat of the tree of life. All those wicked people. It says, she says, they were trying to attack the, the powers of heaven so they get into the amazing stuff. Okay, um, what, what else did God promise to Abraham that might impact us? To enjoy true happiness, we must travel into a very far country and even out of ourselves. Thomas Brown is quoted in Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday, April 27. Wait, that's literal? That's pretty powerful. Wow. To enjoy true happiness, we must travel into a very far country and even out of ourselves. Mm. What's he really saying? <laughs> you know, i uh, interested in all these experiments to Mars and so forth now. Yes. And what are, we, what are they looking for? Some hint of life. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently there's no atmosphere there. And oh yeah, there is. There's some. Well, I mean, but not enough to like a, use a helicopter or something to. Well, they sent up. They sent up a little drone. Is They're going to try to use it. it we'll see if they can. Good. Yeah, but it's very thin. Yeah, very thin atmosphere. But you know that that's a very powerful statement there. Yeah. Um, what we just read. I was just thinking about William Carey. We don't have the time yeah. to get into. You know, I mean, look at the Thomas came to India. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, the true happiness. Yeah. You know, greatest happiness uh, to come to yep. those who are full of... Full compliance with God's plans for their lives. Uh, thing, things are starting to change. In Sicily, just a day or so back, they had a big blow-up of a volcano. Really? A big one. Ooh. You can see it back, all the streams coming out. We're seeing more and more of stuff like that, which tends wow. to point one to the fact that maybe we don't have too long to run. Yeah. But what Ellen White says that uh, what we what we neglected to do in yeah. easier times, we'll have to do it in very difficult times. Yes. It's yeah. I I saw uh, I should bring that chart sometime and put it up on the screen. 
someone did a serious research on major disasters. Not, we're not talking about all the little ones, but the major disasters. There were 10 times as many major disasters from 1990 to 2000 as there were between 1900 and 1910. 10 mm. times as many major disasters. Yeah. That's like uh, the ranking of uh, earthquakes. Maybe that's not the word, ranking. Well, yeah, yeah but I mean, we're talk they're times. talking about yeah, major yeah, disasters. They're, they're talking about disasters, would, right. that, of, of whether it's flooding or, or earthquakes or whatever, with a lot of people being killed. Augustine, one of the first Christian apologists, I'm not sure we want to follow him in all details, <laughs> had, some, had some interesting words to say about the human condition. Jim? This life of ours, if a full life so full, excuse me, if a life so full of such great ills can properly be called a life bearer's witness to the fact that from every heart, excuse me, from the very start, the race of mortal men has been a race condemned. Think first of, it's going to be, think first of the dreadful abyss of ignorance from which all error flows and to, so engulfs the sons of Adam in a darkness, darksome pool that no one can escape without the toll of, to, of toils and tears and fears. Then take our very love for all those things that prove so vain and poisonous and breed so many heartaches, troubles, griefs, and fears, such insane joy and discord, strife and wars, such fraud and theft and robbery, such perfidy and pride, envy and ambition, homicide and murder, cruelty and savagery, lawlessness and lust, all the shameful passions of the impure fornication and adultery, incest and unnatural sins, rape and countless other uncleanliness, uncleanlinesses, yeah. too nasty to be mentioned, the sins against religion, sacrilege and heresy, blasphemy and perjury, the iniquity, iniquities given our neighbors, yeah, against, and, our neighbors. against our neighbors, calumnies and cheating, lies and false witness, excuse me, lies and fault with this, <clears throat> violence to persons and property, the injustices of the court and the innumerable other miner miseries and maladies that fill the world yet escape attention. Augustine wow. of Hippo, City of God. I mean, wow, that, what that, a list of sins. Yes. Whoa. Yeah, and really, it, like it. you pointed out a couple of weeks ago, there's only one. Yeah. Yep. Now, oh. he lived in the 500 to 680, somewhere, somewhere in there, Tunisia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is about when Islam came into... Mm -hmm. uh, That's about, about uh, 500-something. 5th century. Early. Yeah, no, 7th, uh, early 7th early century, century Islam. So, right. Late 6th, right. early 7th century. Was it Islam at the time of Islam? 613 or something. About 630. But what I'm saying is, about the same time, he probably was a little earlier. But here is a man who's writing this profound statement. Was he, did he have any control over him from Rome? Because Rome was extremely powerful yeah. at the time. But this is very gentle stuff he's talking about. Very gentle. Do you think those words could apply to some of the places in which we live even today? <laughs> and what kind of environment did Augustine live 1,500 years ago? Are there times in your... Yes? He said he died in 430 A.D. Okay, so oh. he, was, he was a couple hundred years ahead of... Yeah. Ahead of uh, okay. yeah. But Rome, like you said, Rome was powerful through that whole yes, time. Yes, very powerful at the time. Are there times in your daily existence when you have to look up and think of God's promises in order to make it through the day? Look at these promises from God. Isaiah 25, 8, the sovereign Lord will destroy death forever. Death, thou must, thou must die. Huh? Yeah. He will wipe away the tears from everyone's eyes and take away the disgrace his people have suffered throughout the world. The Lord himself has spoken. Good news, Bible. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, however, as the scriptures say, says, what no one ever saw or heard, 
what no one ever thought could happen is the very thing God prepared for those who love him. Good news, Bible. <laughs> Revelation 22, 1 through 5. The angel also showed me the river of water of life, sparkling like crystal and coming from the throne of God and the Lamb and flowing down the middle of the city street. On each side of the river was tree of life, which bears fruit 12 times a year. I'm going to interrupt for a second. This passage here is really almost a repeat from Ezekiel. And what does Ezekiel say about the tree there? Remember? There's all kinds of trees, all a whole bunch of them all the way along the river. I, and that, I, I feel good about that because you think one tree, no matter how big it is, is going to is going to feed even all the all the saved people. Let alone, I mean, do angels get to eat of it or not? They don't need to. But here, Ezekiel says that there's going to be trees all the way along. So I and better, fruits and fruits, all different kinds. new new fruit every month. Yes, yes, um, once each month, and its leaves are for the healing of the nations. I like that. Mm -hmm. Nothing that is under God's cause. Curse, curse will be found in the city. The throne of God and the Lamb will be in the city and His servants will worship Him. They will see His face and His name will be written on their foreheads. There shall be no more night and there will be no need, they will not, not, need. not need lambs or, for, or sunlight because the Lord Himself, the Lord God will be their light and they will rule as kings forever and ever. Good news, Bible. Okay, here's a trivia question for you. If there's not going to be any night, how will we know when the Sabbath comes? <laughs> well, in the very presence of God, there is no night. Okay. But, you know, we're not going to be in the city all the time. We're going to have our farms. Okay. And there's going to be nights there and there's. That's Maybe. my, that's my well, the, thought. The point is, what, what causes day and night in our, in our time, in, in the world today? The rotation of... The rotation there. Is, yeah. is the earth going to stop rotating? We don't think so. The sun might still be out there. The fact that there's light doesn't keep us from going, oh yeah, there went the sun, there went the sun, there went the sun. I, 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 don't, I don't see any problem with that. Well, imagine Abraham's thoughts racing as he, nearly 100 years old and married to a woman long past childbearing age, was told by God himself that he would become the father of a great and mighty nation, and not from Ishmael. When were those promises to Abraham fulfilled? And why would God want to make a great nation out of Abraham's seed? Was there ever a time when Abraham's descendants became great, wonderful witnesses to the world? And what was God's plan for them? Gary? I'm reading from Exodus 19, verses 5 and 6. Now, if you will obey me, and in brackets the Lord, and keep my covenant, you will be my own people. The whole earth is mine, but you will be my chosen people a people dedicated to me alone, and you will serve me as priests. And that again from the Good News Bible. <clears throat> and uh, we're moving on to Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 to 3. Arise, Jerusalem, and shine like the sun. The glory of the Lord is shining on you. Other nations will be covered by darkness, but on you the light of the Lord will shine. The brightness of his presence will be with you. Nations will be drawn to your light and kings to the dawning of your new day. From the Good News Bible again. Let me interrupt there for, for another question. You know, to these ancient people, a king was someone way, you know, really, really powerful and so forth, I guess. Are there going to be any kings in the New Jerusalem? Who's going to be the servants? <laughs> if you what good is it being a king? But it also well, was it was it in uh, Exodus? You'll be kings. Excuse me. You'll be priests. Kings and priests. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I, I think what's going to happen up there, we're going to know, here's David, he was a king, hi, but we're not going to bow down to him or anything like that. These were kings. It seems to me we'll all be on a more equal ground. Yeah, absolutely. No one will care, <laughs> really, <laughs> because everyone, I mean, <laughs> It's, um, what does St. Paul say? Neither has it come in the hearts of people what the yeah. Lord is preparing for us. I mean, we're going to be so fascinated yeah. with, with the sight of Jesus Christ, with Paul himself. I mean, we're going to be fascinated. Just tell yeah. us. What Just think about on. that. I, there's a story told that always amuses me. I've told it several times. Some of you have probably heard it. There's a place in Pennsylvania John, John, Jonestown, yes, that's at the end of a long valley. And for a while there, back in the 1800s, about every 17 years, they had a massive flood. And they just about wipe out the city and they just about get it rebuilt, there'd be another flood. And the story goes, this is of course a hypocr uh, apocryphal story, but the story goes that this man died and went to heaven. And when he got there, St. Peter says, well, welcome, anything I can do for you? Oh, yes. Please, I want to tell all these people about the Jonestown flood. Okay, fine. So he calls all the people gathered around, and the man's getting up, and he's going so excited because there's a whole new audience that can hear his story. And he's just getting ready to start, and St. Peter comes, and taps him on the shoulder, says, You see the man with the long beard in the front row? Yeah. Mm -hmm. His name is Noah. <laughs> 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 you know, you, you think about you think about stories like this. You, you, know, you wonder about some of these things. How often are we going to run to Moses and say, "Why did you write that?" What you know? It's, it's, the, they probably deny some of it. Yeah, <laughs> that, he, that he didn't write it. That's who knows. Uh, we you know where did it come from? We'll find out. Okay, Carrie. Sorry. All right. Uh, moving along to the fourth chapter of Deuteronomy, and we're uh, going to start with verses 6 through 8. Obey them faithfully, and this will show you, show the people, rather, of other nations how wise you are. When they hear of all these laws, they will say, What wisdom and understanding this great nation has! No other nation, no matter how great, has a God who is so near when they need him as the Lord our God is to us. He answers us whenever we call for help. No other nation, no matter how great, has laws so just as those that I have taught you today. That's from Good News Bible. And I, uh, I just want to point out something that maybe you have not, some of you out there haven't come across. There are many so-called biblical scholars today that don't believe that it's possible for us to do anything here on planet or Earth that affects God in any way. God is way up there. He's sovereign. There's nothing we can do that impact Him in any way. What does this say? No other nation, no yeah. matter how great. God is so near to us. Yeah. When they need Him, what happens? The Lord's there ready to help us, right? Yes. It was, and, and, you know, the whole great controversy thing, that's, that's all about that, isn't it? It was clearly God's plan for Abraham's descendants to be witnesses to the entire world. And that, is that why he gave them a home at the crossroads of the ancient, ancient world? Yes. Isaiah 56, 7 says, I will bring you to Zion, my sacred hill, give you joy in my house of prayer, and accept the sacrifices you offer on my altar. My temple will be a, called a house of prayer for the people of all nations, from the Good News Bible. And then from Ellen White, the children of Israel were to occupy all the territory which God appointed them. Those nations that rejected the worship and service of the true God were to be dispossessed I want you to notice that very important word. It doesn't say God said go out and kill them all. He said, chase them out. If they want to join you, okay, let them come back. Let them join you. But if they worship the true God. They were not to be killed. I don't think mm -hmm. anywhere it says just push them It off. does say that. It does say it. It does say that. But it says that at a time when the children of Israel, all they could think of is give us swords. We're going to, God says, well, that's the way you want to do things. But one thing, though, he did not want them to be mixed. No. 
he wanted a wall was fine okay but you can go out and talk with but i want you to keep you separate because he knew what would happen yeah. and if you look at the map if you get and not many people have, have tried to do this but if you look at the map by the time they settled into the land of canaan they were just scattered out with pavement people all through them it was it was terrible but and they came out of the out of the uh, wilderness as pagans yeah we read read uh, amos 425 yeah. and uh, also with uh, stephen's uh, speech yeah they told him he basically read did uh, amos 425 yeah okay carrie the children of israel were to occupy all the territory which god appointed them those nations that rejected the worship and service of the true god were to be dispossessed but it was God's <clears throat> purpose that by the revelation of his character through Israel men should be drawn unto him. To all the world the gospel invitation was to be given. Through the teaching of the sacrificial service Christ was to be uplifted before the nations and all who would look unto him should live. And that's from Christ's Object Lessons, page 290, paragraph 1. This past week, I had the privilege of speaking to a young man who's involved with an organization connected to the Adventist Church that is sending messages, true messages about the gospel and about salvation and so forth, all over the world. There is no place you can go, I don't know, maybe in the middle of Antarctica, I don't know, maybe, where their, their message doesn't reach to. It's amazing. Through the internet. Huh? Through the well, internet. through the internet, they're, they're using internet, they're using radio broadcasts, they're using all kinds of means, and they're just, I mean, if you, if you know how to tune into them, you can, fi you can find them no matter where you are. Mm. Well, since Abraham and his descendants did not accomplish all that God wanted them to do, was that task then passed on to us? Yes. <laughs> First Peter 2, 9, but you are the chosen race, the king's priests, the holy nation, God's own people, chosen to proclaim the wonderful acts of God who called you out of darkness into his own marvelous light. So if the children of Israel didn't do what they were supposed to do, does that pass the, the baton to us? Well, I'd go back a little bit. Huh? Mm -hmm. That word priest is appropriate there. King's priest? Yeah. Are you talking about that? Yeah. Yeah. It is appropriate. So we are royal priesthood then. That's right. The translation is right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So what does it mean to make someone's name great? Genesis 12, 2. Why did God make that promise to Abraham? Jim? Romans 4, 1 to 5. What shall we say then of Abraham, the father of our race? What was his experience? If he was put right with God by the things he did, he would have something to boast about, mm. but not in God's sight. The scripture says Abraham believed God and believed of his faith. And, and because God of his faith. Made, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. Those who work are paid wages, but they are not regarded as a gift. They are something that has never has been earned. But those who depend on faith not on deeds, and who believe in God who declared the guilty to be innocent, it is his faith that God takes into account in order to put them right with himself. Okay. James 2, 21 to 24. How far, excuse me, how was our ancestor Abraham put right with God? It was through his actions. When he offered his son Isaac on the altar, can't you see his faith and his actions worked together? His faith was made perfect through his actions. And the scripture came, excuse me, and the scripture came true that said, Abraham believed God, and because of his faith, God accepted him as righteous. And so Abraham, Ab Abraham called God's friend. Was called. And so Abraham was called God's friend. You see then that it is by people's actions that they are put right with God and not by their faith alone. And this, of course, would be one of the verses that led uh, Luther to reject the book of James completely. Yeah, in Hebrew, 
At one time, he didn't like Hebrew either. I think that's to Revelation he, he, and he, he, he didn't and like four. he didn't like um, <laughs> Hebrews, James, James, Jude, Second Peter, and oh, Revelation. More than so, there's it, five. Yeah, there's really five. Yeah. Yeah. However, you see, when we look into it, there is no conflict between what James is saying and what Paul has been fighting. Yes, there's none. It's all yeah. the same. So where did he get this idea, James, that God was, uh, that Abraham was God's friend? Second Chronicles 27, King Jehoshaphat prayed aloud, you are our God when you, excuse me, when your people Israel moved into this land and you drove out the people who were living there and gave the land to the descendants of Abraham, your friend, to be theirs forever. Hmm. That's okay. one of the key text, is it not, for uh, Kingdom of Israel? Yes. Nation of Israel? Yep. <clears throat> what kind of people are considered to be great in our day? How would you compare what you know about Abraham to what you know about modern day actors, politicians, artists, and the wealthy? If you, uh, I, I like to run marathons. And I've run the LA Marathon, Los Angeles Marathon, probably 20 times at least. And one of the sections that we go through is down through Hollywood, and there's what's called the Walk of Fame. And so you're running along here, and here's all these stars it, right into the pavement of the sidewalk and so forth with all the famous people's names on them. And there, who are they? Actors, politicians, artists, wealthy. Isn't that uh, 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 Matthew 23, 13 and following? They'd be uh, listed in that bunch, wouldn't they? Yeah. <laughs> well, when do you scribe spirits and hypocrites? <laughs> yeah. Contrast the thoughts of the builders of the Tower of Babel with those, these prom those promises given to Abraham. Genesis 11, 4. They said, Now let's build a city with a tower that reaches the sky so that we can make a name for ourselves and not be scattered all over the earth. Good news translation again. Okay, now contrast that with Genesis 12, 2. The Lord said to Abraham, I will give you many descendants, and they will become a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous, so that you will be a blessing. Good okay, news Bible again. So what's the contrast between these two? Uh, one is men are saying, the other one, the Lord is giving him a promise. Exactly, exactly. And because their behavior was completely contrasting, wasn't it? Yes. I mean, think of the people building the Tower of Babel, Aaron, and then think of Abraham. That's where though also Sunday worship started in Babel. Yes. But a much wider audience is involved than what might immediately be apparent to us. I think this is really important to keep in mind. Carrie? However much the plan of salvation rests only upon the work of Christ in our behalf, we, as recipients of God's grace, are nevertheless still involved. We have a role to play. Our free choice comes into prominence. The drama of the ages, the battle between Christ and Satan, is still being played out in and through us. Both humanity and angels are watching what is happening with us in the conflict. And in brackets, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9. And in brackets, as quoted just below, the thus who we are, what we say, what we do, far from having no importance beyond our own immediate sphere, has implications that can, in a sense, reverberate across the universe. By our words, our actions, even our attitudes, we can help bring glory to the Lord, who has done so much for us, or we can bring shame upon him and his name. Thus, when the Lord said to Abraham that he would make his name great, he surely was not talking about it in the same way the world talks about someone as having a great name. What makes a great name in the eyes of God is character, faith, obedience, humility, and love for others, traits that might often be respected in the world but are not usually the factors the world would deem as making someone's name great. <laughs> That's from our Bible study guide for Thursday, April 29th. 
And then there's that passage that you mentioned there, 1 Corinthians 4, 9, for it seems to me, this is Paul speaking, that God has given the very last place to us apostles. Like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle, the Greek word is the theater for the whole world of angels and of humanity. Who's watching everything that's happening here on earth? The, all look in the angels. The entire universe. Yeah, yes, yes. Not some maybe life out on Mars. We're <laughs> about some. And what about the, that final terrible test that was brought upon Abraham when God instructed him to go to a distant place and sacrifice his miracle son? Hmm. Jim? It was no light test that was thus brought upon Abraham. No small sacrifice that was required of him, but he did not hesitate to obey the call. He had no question to ask concerning the land of promise. God has spoken and his servant must be obey. The happiest place on earth for him was the place where God would have him to be. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 126. This, we, we live in a part of the world where people say, what's, what's the happiest place on earth? Well, it's Disney is what they say. That's, they, they advertise as being the happiest place on the world. No, the happiest place on the, earth, on the world or in the universe is the place where God wants you to be. The happiest place is the place where God wants you to be. <clears throat> there was a lot more involved in that trial than most imagine. The sacrifice required of Abraham was not alone for his own good, nor solely for uh, the benefit of succeeding generations, but it was also for the instruction of the sinless intelligences of heaven and other worlds. Can I interrupt now for a second? Who is learning something from us? The unfallen world. The unfallen, the sinless intelligences of heaven. Yes. They're watching us and they're learning it from us. There's, it, there's three places in the Bible that talks about that. Uh, Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10, and Colossians 1, 19 and 20. It's right there. Go ahead. The field of controversy between Christ and Satan, the field on which the plan of redemption is wrought out, is the lesson book of the universe. Because Abraham had 155, that's had shown, I'm sorry. Has shown, uh, this, uh, you put in parenthesis. 155, 155, that's the beginning of page 155. I see, sorry, okay. Shown a lack of faith in God's promises. Satan has accused him before the angels and before God of having failed to comply with the conditions of the covenant and uh, unworthy of its blessings. God desired, desired to prove the loyalty of his servant before all heavens, to demonstrate that nothing less than perfect obedience can be accepted, and to open more fully before them the plan of salvation. That's a little scary, isn't it? Mm. Nothing less than perfect obedience. Uh, I want you to think about this. Now, we're going to read here. You know the story of Abraham. He gets this dream in the middle of the night. He says, take your son and take it off three days' journey to that mountain and so forth. Um, think about this. And the entire universe is watching. Satan and all, all his angels are watching. God and all his angels are watching. But, but, but he, the Creator himself, put his credibility on the balance. That's right. And, and he had so much trust. Forget Abraham having trust in him. He had so much trust, just like Job. Yep. I know my, my servant Job is not going to fail me. Yep. And he's saying the same thing about he's, Abraham here. He's saying the same thing about Abraham. Okay. Come to think. Heavenly beings were witnesses of the sin as the faith of Abraham and the submission of Isaac were tested. The trial was far more severe than that which had been brought upon Adam. Mm -hmm. Compliance with the prohibition laid upon our first parents involved no suffering, but the command to Abraham demanded the most agonizing sacrifice. All heaven beheld 
and one with wonder and admiration Abraham's unfaltering obedience he says uh, dad uh, yeah. where is the lamp yeah. God will provide yes. <laughs> don't ask let's keep yeah. on going God will provide um, God declared to his servant uh, uh, you read the important lesson the lesson the sentence right above it all right all heaven oh, no. applauded okay. his Fidelity, Satan's accusations were shown to, to be false. false. That's the important. Satan's accusations were shown to be false. I mean, you can think about them. I mean, this is like a giant Super Bowl. Really? Yes. And here's God and all these people on one side, and Satan and all his group are on the other side, and they're all watching Abraham. That's not a whole lot different than the friends of Job. Yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah. It's a, it's a re replay of. Yep. Uh, and of course, it was Job was written way believed by, by, by Abraham. Yeah, somewhere. And now, this is we're reading from Ellen White. Yes, Not, I meant uh, Moses. Uh, the, come to think, I I grew up an Adventist. Mm -hmm. and this is the first time. I'm sorry, I'm confessing. You know, this really? is the first time. I'm a little, well, that's why I put it in here. There you are. Thank you so this, much. This, Thank this you. was not in here. You understand? Yeah. I, I, uh, no, I, this is this is really truly beautiful. Yeah. This is beautiful. Yeah, God declared to his servant, now I know that thou fearest God, notwithstanding Satan's charges. And that is in the original. Mm. Go ahead. Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Of course, the, the context there is, is quoted straight from Scripture. Yes, God's covenant. And Ellen White, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting. No, that's fine. Ellen please. White is the one who put in, notwithstanding Satan's charges, she wants to make it absolutely, absolutely. clear that that's what's going on. The yeah, entire yeah. universe, they're, they're in the stands of this great controversy watching Abraham, and when God wins, I mean, there must have been a oh, shout that wow. they rocked the heavens. Yes. Yes, and I know, I mean, we cannot even think about Abraham failing God. Yeah. <laughs> Let's not even go there. Okay, uh, God's covenant confirmed to Abraham by an oath before the intelligences of other world testified that obedience will be rewarded. It had been difficult even for the angels to grasp the mystery of redemption to comprehend that thing that the commander of heaven, the son of God, must die for guilty man. When the command was given to Abraham to offer up his son, the interest of all heavenly beings was enlisted. With intense earnestness, they watched each step in the fulfillment of their command, of this command, went to Isaac's question, what is the lamb for the for burnt offering? Abraham exactly. made an answer, God will provide himself a lamb. And when the father's hand was stayed, as he was about to slay his son, the ram which God had provided was offered in the place of Isaac. Then light was shed upon the mystery of redemption and even the angels understood more clearly the wonderful provision that God had made for man's salvation. Wow. First Peter 1. And well, this is that whole section, yeah. Patriarchs and Prophets 154 and 155. And I would like to say, go back and read those pages, read them again and again. Mm. We might summarize some of the conversations God had with Abraham after he entered Canaan as follows. Okay. When Abram entered Canaan, the Lord appeared to him and made it clear that he was to sojourn in the land that would be given to his descendants. That's from Genesis 12, 7. God repeated this promise several times. See Genesis... You, you, don't, don't, read, you don't need to read all the verses. All right. Some 400 years later, in fulfillment of the promises, Genesis 15, 13, and 16, the Lord announced to Moses that he would bring Israel out of Egypt into a land flowing with milk and honey. Exodus 3, 8, 17, and Exodus 6, 8. God repeated the promise to Joshua, Joshua 1, 3. And in David's day, it was largely, but not completely fulfilled. And there's lots of passages there. Yeah. Yes. 
Okay, we're running out of time here. Was there ever a time when Abraham's descendants ruled from the Euphrates, Euphrates to Egypt? Yes. 1 Kings 4, 21. Yes. Solomon's kingdom in the last days of David and the early days of Solomon included all the nations from the river Euphrates to Philistia and the Egyptian border. They paid him taxes and were subject to him all his life. Good news, Bible. It is very interesting to read what later inspired writers have said about Abraham. We've got about enough time to read that. Go ahead, Jim. Abraham, excuse me, Hebrews 11, 9 to 16. By faith he, Abraham, lived as a foreigner in the country that God had promised him. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who received the same promise from God. For Abraham was waiting for the city which God has designed and built, the city with permanent foundations. It was faith that made Abraham able to become a father, even though he was too old and Sarah herself could not have children. He trusted God to keep his promise. Though Abraham was practically dead, from this one man came every, excuse me, as Amen. many descendants as there were stars in the sky, as many as the numberless grains of sand on the seashore. It was in faith that all of these persons died. They did not receive the things God had promised, but from a long way off they saw him, saw them and welcomed them and admitted openly that they were foreigners and refugees on the earth. Those who say such things make it clear <clears throat> that they are looking for a country of their own. They did not keep thinking about the country they had left. If they had, they would have had the chance to return. Instead, it was better country they longed for, the heavenly country, and so God is not ashamed for them to call them, call, call him their God, because he has prepared a city for them, the Good News Bible. And we read in the New Testament, Matthew 5 and 2 Corinthians 4, uh, promises that God has made to us. And then we come down to Revelation 21, 9 and 10. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came to me and said, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. The Spirit took control of me, and the angel carried me to the top of a very high mountain. He showed me Jerusalem, the holy city, coming down out of heaven from God. And that is our future home. Do you think God's covenants are too difficult? God is asking too much from us. How much is included? God will protect us in every way, and I might add, He will provide us a future home that will be indestructible. Why do you think this is so hard for people in Jesus' day to recognize that? We'll let you answer that question. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you so much for these promises, these ideas, these things that we need, to, we need to study and learn from. We thank you so much from the insights, for the insights that Ellen White has given us. The, the ideas of the great controversy and how they played out in the lives of Job and Abraham and others down through the generations. And Lord, we know that the last battle, the fever pitch, is coming just ahead of us. May we be ready is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.